Hello, and thank you for joining the Salt Stack Best of Salt Comp 16 webinar series. Uh, today, we are pleased to uh, bring to you uh, Corey Quinn, uh, who is uh, a long time and one of the earliest contributors to the Salt Open Source Project and a director of DevOps for uh, a finance and, and banking company out of the, out of the Bay Area. Um, we have established this webinar series based on feedback that uh, we received from uh, SaltConf 16 attendees, and um, we wanted to make these talks available uh, to uh, a broader audience. And so uh, we, we thank you for joining this morning. Um, just to keep in mind before we hand things off to Corey for the, the main part of this, this presentation, uh, we uh, last webinar we had Chris or Edwards of Adobe talk about security configuration, uh, compliance, and, and automation. Uh, that webinar recording is available um, through uh, our, our website. It's easy to find there. Today we're happy to have Corey Quinn with us uh, talking about uh, the title of his presentation is Heresy in the Church of Docker. Um, and uh, in July, the next webinar in this series will be delivered by Drew Malone of Cloud Era, talking about how SaltStack is, is not just configuration management, there's so much more. And so to, to, for more information on any of these webinars, uh, please register at uh, the URL shown there on the slide. Um, and uh, um, we appreciate your interest in, in SaltStack. Just a couple of housekeeping items before we turn over to Corey. Um, the lines are muted just to preserve audio quality, uh, but we do welcome questions uh, via the chat function in, in GoToMeeting. Um, we are recording this session uh, so that uh, all attendees uh, who are registered uh, can receive um, uh, a version of, of, this, of this webinar and uh, share it with your friends as well. Um, so keep in mind if you do miss anything, uh, we will be providing that recording to you most likely within about 24 hours uh, after, after we wrap up today. Uh, also a reminder, uh, you know, these, uh, this webinar today is, is topical, right? We're, we're talking about uh, this, this new phenomenon of, of Docker and, and, uh, and containers and how they are applicable to our, our lives in, uh, in DevOps and in IT operations. Um, we are not providing an overview of SaltStack uh, today. Um, if you are new to SaltStack, if you're just getting started with SaltStack, if you want to understand how SaltStack can be used uh, to, um, to manage everything from cloud to containers to applications to any infrastructure, um, please uh, go to docs.saltstack.com, which is a great reference uh, site, especially if you're just getting started. And is also for the more advanced user, uh, we've got a lot of good information and, and documentation on, on the use of SaltStack. Um, but uh, we, we do provide um, Salt as an open source uh, uh, package. We invite everyone to use it and to become successful with it. And we are invest, invested in making sure that, that all users are quickly successful with, with SaltStack. And so, um, uh, please, you know, reach out to us if there's anything that we can help with. Um, we've got that, that email address there uh, on the slide that uh, if you do have any questions or, or do need help, um, we can, uh, we'd be more than happy to, to help uh, with your implementation or uh, answer any questions about SALT. So with that, uh, let me turn over the presentation control to Corey and uh, we'll get to the reason you've you've all uh, joined us here this morning. Corey, you should have control now, and I'm going to make sure, yep, it looks like you are off mute. I can now see your slides, so take it away. Perfect, that looks good. 
All right. Thank you all for uh, listening to this. Uh, please feel free to tweet at me throughout the course of this, ask questions in the chat, et cetera. I'm always willing to have a conversation about this stuff. Uh, so this talk originally started out as a profanity-laced night-style talk, where slides ought to advance every 15 seconds, uh, lasting five minutes. And someone thought that this would somehow be a good talk to give in a feature-length format. I'm very sorry for what's about to happen. So it's worth pointing out before we get into this that DockerCon ended yesterday. And to be very fair to Docker, they did address a lot of things that I talked about in the first version of this talk that I gave at SaltConf. So as a result, this talk is now obsolete and irrelevant to anything else going on in the world. So I'm not going to talk about Docker today. Uh, instead, this talk is now called That Time My Boss Destroyed a Cubicle. And this is a completely true story. So let me take you back in time for about a decade. Uh, this was my first Linux admin gig, and my new boss had just started. He was doing everything right, he was dressing well, he was getting into shape, and he was hoping to make a very strong first impression. Given what this story is called, you can pretty safely assume that he did that. So one morning we come to work and we hear the strangest noise throughout the cubicle farm. It sounded a bit like shuka, 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 poof. So we all prairie dog over the side of our cubicles. And what we wind up seeing is, well, let's back up for a second. In order to understand what it is that we saw, it really helps to understand what caused it. In order to hit his fitness goals, my boss was making a lot of protein shakes in the morning, and that was how he wound up trying to lose weight. And to stay alert, he was also drinking an awful lot of coffee, which makes sense. I'm something of an addict myself. And to save time, optimizing for the right things, like a good operations person, he decided to start mixing the two of these things together inside of a sealed Tupperware container that didn't have an outgas valve. So here's a little known fact. If you remember nothing else from the rest of this presentation, remember this. Slimfast powder mixed with coffee in a sealed environment equals pressure buildup. A lot of pressure. How much pressure are we talking? Enough to blow the lid off of that Tupperware container so yeah, that pretty much brings us back up to speed with where I was in the story. So we wind up peering over the side of this cubicle wall, and we just see a disaster area. Uh, there's coffee mixed with SlimFast all over his clothes, all over his computer, all over his desk, and of course, all over himself. And he stands there with the most forlorn, shocked, dismayed, and frankly embarrassed look on his face that you can possibly imagine. And one year later, when I left that job, the chocolate blast ring was still there in the cubicle. So what's the point of this story, funny though it is? I mean, how is it relevant to anything going on in the modern DevOps configuration management containerized space? I mean, it's really in its heart just a story about someone who, despite knowing how his container worked, didn't understand how it would behave in production, how it could fail, or what those failure cases would manifest itself as. And there's the metaphor. Okay, let's get back to the Docker talk. Um, one thing I do want to point out in all seriousness is that this is not designed to tear down a promising new technology. It's to discuss some of the challenges that we have with getting containers in, its, in their current form into production. Uh, as a disclaimer, at other conferences, I've given talks on Git, giving live demos inside of Docker containers. Uh, this talk has no demos at all because I couldn't find a good way to uh, live stream me exploding a Tupperware container all over the conference room, but you can imagine what that would have looked like. So what's the problem here? Why would Docker in production be a problem? So Let's, before we get into the areas in which it struggles, let's talk a little bit first about what Docker is. Docker is a relatively new container technology that Fortune 100 companies are going nuts over, like 19-year-old college students on spring break. Why is that? Well, that's a great question. Glad I asked it. 
It's because Docker is not only the best container technology out there, it is also the first ever operating system level container system. I and mean, this has never been done before. Well, you know, except for LXC, which has been in the Linux kernel for over a decade. But that's okay, because Docker did, does leverage this. A lot of its early work was built on top of LXC, so we'll say that's part of Docker. Or Solaris Zones, which are about the same age. Um, funny story, when I gave this talk two months ago, I made this joke, and it went relatively well. In that time, someone has come out with code that lets you run Docker on top of Solaris Zones. I'm not kidding. I wish I was. So that tends to be a little bit of a problem with talking about a fast-moving technology. The jokes that we make become tomorrow's reality, and you're not quite sure if you're being trolled or not. We're also going to have to count FreeBSD jails as another version of OS containers, which fundamentally have been used to great success in a wide variety of different applications. And if jails count, obviously change routes do too, or true routes. They've been around since 82 or 83. And if you're going to count change routes, then uh, OpenVZ is effectively a true route on steroids. So that winds up having some management tools baked in, which makes it even easier to work through. Web hosting companies have been using this for 15 years and change, so I suppose that's going to count. And way back in time, we had something called LPARs, which were how you partitioned enormous expensive mainframe compute technology into different usable chunks for different applications and different users, which is, of course, a direct straight line shot to virtualization. Uh, for anyone who wasn't in tech, back in the early 2000s, before we had the Docker, Docker, Docker hype, we had cloud, cloud, cloud hype, but before that, we had vert, vert, vert hype. Hype evangelists are not new creatures, they just tend to change form and talk about different things. Which fundamentally, finally winds up leaving us to Doc, to Vagrant, um, specifically, which is probably the closest analog to Docker that we've seen until now, just in the sense of the mean time to Dobelin effect. In other words, if you want to write code, okay, great. How quickly can I get this code that I just wrote into some semblance of a running environment that looks kind of like production? Great. Vagrant gets you there very quickly. You hit the button, and it's running. So, okay, we're probably going to have to concede that Docker is not the first, uh, first horse in this race. So if it's not the first, what makes Docker different from all of these? What makes it so revolutionary rather than just the next evolutionary step? You know, besides the $180 million in investment that they've taken from these 10 investors so far, uh, I would like to point out as well that that is investment in Docker itself, not ecosystem companies, Mesosphere, Kubernetes, the rest. That tends to be a whole separate kettle of wax. But I digress. So if you've been in technology for a decent period of time, by which I mean more than a couple of years, we have a thing called a three-tiered architecture. Uh, this dates back to the Stone Age, also known as about four years ago. You had different tiers for different systems. You had web servers hanging out in the DMZ. You had application or job servers, depending upon your terminology that those spoke to. And in turn, those apps and servers wound up speaking to the database. And you knew where everything was. Systems were segregated. It made sense. Oh, the application server is slow? Great. I know where that lives. I'm going to go look at that. But now with Docker, we're moving into what's known as a tectonic shift to a microservices-based architecture, where things wind up living wherever it is they wind up being scheduled, and there's really no guarantee that things aren't going to move around on you at various times and places. So. I'm going to stop here for a second and talk briefly about what a microservice is. A lot of people tend to nod sagely when the term comes up, but don't actually know what it means, like me, until I wound up building this talk. So, unfortunately, going with a microservices-based systems architecture is not going to save you from yourself. But it might let you kick the can down the road a few years until the next new thing comes out, and it buys you time. So people love it right now. What makes this somewhat complicated is, much like the term DevOps, if you wind up getting five people in a room and asking them what microservices are, you're going to get something like seven answers. So it's almost impossible to define clearly, but they do have some defining characteristics. Uh, please note that this is not an exhaustive list, but it's some of the common themes that I'm seeing. 
Uh, for example, instead of having a giant massive application in a monolith, you wind up breaking each function out into its own process. And those processes, in turn, wind up communicating with each other via API calls, uh, generally via HTTP, and it usually takes the form of stabilized APIs, which means they don't tend to change much, and when they do, they're well-versioned. That becomes important. If you wind up breaking that, everything stops working, and it's very hard to troubleshoot why. Which speaks to, specifically to the fact that microservices, by their nature, are modular. So if you have a microservice whose sole job is to take a query for I don't know, a product ID and then return how many of those products you have in stock, what that microservice winds up doing under the hood can change completely as long as the API itself doesn't change. So that whatever system I have answering that question, I can change the database over from MySQL to Oracle. I can rewrite the entire system in Scala instead of Python the way it's currently written. And because it's interfaced, the rest of the application doesn't change, I can launch the new service, I can fall back to the old one, and the rest of the application, and thus the world, doesn't notice or care. This also leads to a result where things tend to be environment agnostic. So you can view your servers just as a pile of resource, uh, whether it's CPU, RAM, disk, and you can cohabitate things with each other. So as long as the resources are available, it doesn't really matter whether it's inside of a VM, whether it's on a cloud instance, whether it's on bare metal, because if it just views the environment as a pile of resource that it can consume, a lot of these things start abstracting away. And the great bonus that really is driving this is a business need that's getting answered here, in which you can now take your ever larger development teams and break them up into groups that focus on different microservices. Uh, small teams of developers working on a service that only does one thing is a lot faster than having 500 developers working on one giant monolith. The problem you run into there is that you have multiple developers all working on the same thing. A group of developers in sufficient numbers is always called a merge conflict. It tends to not end well. Uh, again, as I mentioned, this is not an exhaustive list. Uh, for example, one somewhat controversial characteristic is the idea that a microservice should never have more than 100 lines of code. I understand where that comes from, but I find that idea ridiculous. Again, how it does what that purpose is really stops mattering once you've broken out the function appropriately. And the last benefit of a microservices characteristic of a microservices environment is that it makes your whiteboard diagram look like this, which is a lot more impressive than a monolith when you've got an audience watching a webinar or a conference talk, or frankly, is an engineering team. It's complex, it's interesting, it's not immediately understandable at first glance, and it gets deeper. Because strapping your servers as they are today into a microservices world doesn't quite work. For example, many systems these days expect to be able to control aspects of their environment, uh, think networking, for example, uh, via API calls, which bare metal servers are historically poor at. So you need a layer in between. This is an actual OpenStack diagram, which runs on complexity, as opposed to AWS, which provides similar uh, services, but instead of complexity, runs on money. Uh, this is an official OpenStack architecture diagram. This is why I'm often seen drinking before noon. Uh, it tends to be complex, difficult to understand, and it's not very clear where, thing, where problems arise from. So now you wind up with this layer of unclear complexity riding on top of another layer of unclear complexity, all in the name of a quote-unquote modern systems architecture. And I find that relatively sad. I mean, that, it's getting to a point where you have to almost weep for this modern state of DevOps and weep for the sad puppy with coffee and slim fast semi-permanently stuck in his fur. But how did we get to this point in the first place? I mean, the, the entire reason behind Docker and why it exists is that it makes development look an awful lot like production, which is great. I mean, we finally managed to solve the silo problem. This is old school, before DevOps. I mean, we're, we're all DevOps here, right? It's totally a legitimate dog title. It's, uh, it's, I mean, historically, you take a look at how Docker positions themselves, and, it talk, and you take a look at having a container ship, where what's inside of the container 
doesn't really matter to operations. That's the, if, whether you're, if you take a look at the real world, you have containers moving around the world. It doesn't matter whether they contain uh, grain or electronic devices or small pets. From the shipper's perspective, it's the people who are building the inside of these containers and development in this context don't have to worry about how the goods get from A to B, and the people getting the goods from A to B don't have to worry about what's inside the container. This is great, and this is why Docker exists. The problem is, and the benefit of this at the same time, is that it makes development on your laptop look absolutely identical to production. It's flawless. It just works. Uh, Docker lives in both places. There's no more solving for the, well, it just works on my machine argument. Except you don't have to schedule containers on your laptop. They just live on your laptop. That's it. And Kubernetes or Mesos is really, really heavy, really, really complex, and are both squarely aimed at solving some of the biggest and interesting problems in this space. If you work on Kubernetes, you may very well wish to speak to some of these fine investors. I hear they're looking for something interesting and new to throw money out of this space. This is the future. Call these folks immediately. Which brings us to one of our next challenges here, uh, specifically networking. You don't see a whole lot of people today talking about getting networking working properly with Docker on their laptop in the same way that they don't talk about people, uh, you don't see people talking about what daily life on a slaughterhouse kill floor is like. It's messy and it's complex and it's being worked on, but there are strange errors you see when you start putting large numbers of Docker containers into a production-like environment that are very difficult to understand, let alone diagnose and fix. It's still complex, it's still slow, it's still arcane, and it still just works on my laptop. So let's make it worse. In most traditional deployments, you generally don't tend to knife switch cutover when you release a new version of your code. You phase things in and out. I mean, ideally you do some form of canary analysis where you've got a box that is highly instrumented running the new version of your code alongside a bunch of things running the last version and you look for increases in error rates and you're able to roll back if it looks disastrous or roll forward if it was working well. And this is great and that works relatively well in most environments until you approach the problem like a schema change where the back end changes in ways that's going to break the previous version. So you can't necessarily do that one back and forth in the same way. Now, this is a solvable problem, obviously. We've all solved for that in our current environments. The problem that we have is that that release process that we have built and solved for those specific problems with are complex, unique, and exist in our current legacy environments. Everything about that has now gone out the window in, a, in the context of a Dockerized model because now you have to effectively reinvent your deployment process because everything you built to solve the old way just became obsolete. And as a production ops person, your problems are really just beginning here. We wind up now having to talk about monitoring an immutable infrastructure. It, the challenge here is that when you don't have instances that are either long-lived or that don't wind up having uh, recognizable host names, you wind up having some different challenges here. Because let's say, for example, that a system stops working, or God forbid, is slow. You have to plan for a world where you're getting meaningful metrics out of a container enable, that will enable you to solve weird intermittent issues that by the time you notice the issue, the container no longer exists in the place where it was. So by the time you get there, the other containers already been spun up somewhere else, the intermittent problem's over, and it's gone. Additionally, Docker host names are random, and every time you instantiate a container, it winds up with a new host name that is randomly generated, which winds up meaning that you're now going to be in a very unpleasant place using anything traditional like Nagios that cares very much about the idea of systems being permanent pets, and you care about them by name tied closely to monitoring is supervision. Um, see, process and container supervision is a tricky thing because sometimes, despite our best efforts as developers, processes die. And there's a giant pile of tooling out there to help ensure that they don't do that, or if they do, that they come back quickly. Docker tries to solve this, but so does System D, and so does Supervisor D, and three other tooling sets as well. 
And the reason that this is a problem, hey, options are great, right? Yes, but by the time you've come this far along in the decision tree, you're rapidly approaching the point where your entire infrastructure is resembling a beautiful unicorn that looks nothing like anything does anywhere else in the known world. Oh, and by the way, just in case we've lost sight of this, none of what I'm talking about so far is even on the horizon in the Docker container you're writing code in on your laptop. So now we are 50 slides in, and we finally get to the idea of configuration management in an immutable world at a configuration management webinar. Uh, Docker is increasingly seeing their place in the world as being a form of config management. I understand this perspective. They are wrong. Uh, an example of this, you spin up a Docker container. Maybe it's on your laptop, maybe it's in a staging environment, maybe it's in production. You have to spin up the same container in each one or your testing winds up being rapidly out of skew. What's the database endpoint in those different things? Do you bake all of the credentials and all of the configuration values into each container as you go? That tends to be a little bit of a problem. Please say no. Do you wind up running a configuration management endpoint inside of a Docker container, be it a puppet agent, a salt minion, or something else? The correct answer to that should also please be no. And the challenge you also see as well, and why I still think that salt is relevant, and I'm bullish on it, is that salt isn't just configuration management. So in some level, having a salt minion inside of a container is not completely crazy, provided you're using it for communication rather than for config management. Uh, one of the challenges as well that I touched on a minute ago is that registration and deregistration of ephemeral things is hard. And by definition, immutable containers themselves don't change. So you can throw the container away and replace it with a new one, and ideally things should still keep on trucking the way that they were before. It's solvable, but you still have to rethink how you're approaching these things. And you've got to be careful with this because you still have that whole rolling deployment thing to contend with as well. This also starts talking about not only service discovery, but peer discovery as well, where containers need to be able to find one another. They need to figure out where the database lives. They need to be able to understand, oh, I need to talk to that other microservice. What's the endpoint? Where does it live? You need to make sure credentials get, ex get exposed to these containers in a secure way. Uh, right now, one of the best answers that people have come up with is using environment variables that, uh, to expose that to the containers, but you've still got to publish that to your infrastructure. So you wind up using a key value storage system, such as console, Zookeeper, etcd, Redis, MongoDB, the time I abused my SQL so badly that I'm still not allowed within 500 feet of an actual relational database, Surf, Doozerd, DNS, Pillar, Sensu, Eureka, what time does the bar open? I mean, none of these solutions here are straightforward. They all have failure modes that are bafflingly complex. And again, none of these problems exist in development in the same way. So let's keep on climbing Mount Hopeless here for a minute. So you've built an awesome container. Let's pretend that you've solved for everything else so far, because these are not impossible to solve problems. So where do you put that container where I can safely put it into production? And this one's interesting. As a part of their initial business model when they launched, Docker offered private registry hosting, uh, starting with pricing starting at $150 a month and ending it, would you like to acquire us outright? So this was great, and then Amazon got into this with a very similar service that offers flat rate linear pricing for 10 cents a gigabyte. Now that's a very reasonable price point, it scales linearly forever, and unless you're doing something profoundly nuts, it makes the cost of running Docker almost irrelevant. Unlike virtually everything else I'm talking about here, I don't have a problem with that. The challenge is, is that these folks very well might. Uh, private repo hosting was Docker's first stab at a monetization model. And I'd like to also point out, as we start looking at other things in this space, that this is the trouble inherent to Amazon. They don't play to win. They play to break even, which makes them an absolutely terrifying competitor because they just need to make a very small amount of money off of everything. So they wind up commoditizing everything on a long enough timeline. Plan for it, they're dangerous. Okay, so we're almost out of room on this slide here. If another group or another company hands me a Docker container, 
it is profoundly difficult for me to audit that container intelligently. How was it built? What lives inside of this container? Is it sane? And more than that, if I grab a container to run MongoDB from the Docker Hub, forget the security implications for a minute. Do I agree with the decisions with how that MongoDB container was set up? And does that setup make sense in my environment? Uh, at SaltConf this year, there were many talks on how to build containers, and one shining consensus emerged. All of the other people giving those talks are doing it wrong. No one really has the right answer here yet. All I have to go on when that container is handed to me is that my developer says, shut up, it's fine, trust me. So we're back into a point where I have no idea what's running in production and it's going to wake me up by breaking at three o'clock in the morning. There's a certain failure of that trust model here. All of which ties into security, which finally completes this list. And I put it at the end of the process because security is generally something you can just bolt on after the fact, so it's not that big of a deal. Yeah, when I made that joke at SaltConf, people laughed. When I made that joke at RSA, nobody laughed. This is something people take seriously, as they should. So let's pretend for a second that a new OpenSSL vulnerability comes out because it's Thursday. Third-party containers abound in your environment. So which ones are patched, which ones aren't? How do you patch the ones that aren't? Recently, something like 70% of images on the Docker Hub as of a few months ago were still vulnerable to Heartbleed, which was over a year old. Uh, for example, when I give my Git talk, I have a container living in Docker that winds up having a bunch of things installed on it to make the demo work. But I haven't updated that thing in six months. There's no re reason to. It's not designed for production. It doesn't expose things to the outside world. And I can guarantee you that someone somewhere is running it in production for some ridiculous reason and causing themselves problems. This becomes a challenge. So now you have a giant list of things that apply in production that don't in development. And I'm not saying these things are unsolvable. But by the time you've solved them, it's highly likely that your environment is effectively unique. Uh, no one else is likely to have made the exact same technology decisions that you did at every layer of the stack, which means you've really got to be on your game with respect to how everything works so you can troubleshoot it if it breaks. If it's not working, if it's slow, what do you do now? Uh, before we move on, I would like to give credit where credit is due. Uh, this entire idea of the quote-unquote Docker cliff was a tweet that was going around by a number of highly effective people from Chef who wound up drawing this on a whiteboard. So by the time it made its way to me, I wasn't sure where this thing originally came from because it had been photoshopped to hell and there was a picture of Wiley Coyote falling off the Docker cliff, which was hilarious but made attribution difficult. So thank you at this point to the folks at Chef for putting this stuff out there. You folks are awesome. Keep doing you. Okay. So the idea that you have to build your own unicorn and build an entire stack speaks to a great myth that I want to address. And in fact, one of the things I wanted to make this entire talk about, so put it at the end, that, that way you've really got people's attention. This is the kind of problem solving and architecting for stupendous scale that Google, Facebook, Netflix, Twitter, et cetera, all have to deal with. And we have this intrinsic belief as software engineers that these shops have the one true answer to how to solve these problems, and they simply don't. They solve their own problems, and their constraints aren't the constraints that we have. A great example of this is Netflix. Uh, they wrote a tremendous number of tooling around Amazon Web Services. Now, why did they do this? because they were operating at stupendous scale, and by the time they started this six years ago or so, you didn't have the level of automation around AWS that Amazon provides to you today. So they were solving for that particular use case. Um, you take a look at Google. They've solved containers for their use cases, soup to nuts, but look at everything that they announce. The day they launch a new product, they've got 10 million users signing up specifically because it's a Google product and people want to try it. Most of us doing things like Twitter for pets generally don't tend to have that same type of use case. We wind up with users trickling in. We can use off-the-shelf components. So having to solve 
these in-depth architecture and infrastructure problems is really putting the cart before the horse. I would argue that unless your company works for an inf works as an infrastructure provider, then devoting significant engineering resources to solving global problems locally for your environment misses the mark. Focus on what your company actually does. So here at the end of this talk, we finally get to the point where why this is profoundly relevant to a configuration management conference. A pure immutable infrastructure and pure configuration management are opposite ends of a spectrum. They're not a binary. And virtually nobody is on one end or the other of, those, of that spectrum. Is the world moving toward immutable? Sure, I mean, that's obviously the case, but it's not a pure immutable move. Does that mean configuration management is dying? Not even a little bit. You've still got to manage the infrastructure that the immutable nodes live on. And again, this is a really easy paradigm to go into if you're developing a new application today. When you're looking at an application that's been around for 20 years, it's not suitable for shoving into a container and calling it good without significant work. And after all the challenges that I've highlighted so far today, does anyone really think that just doing a quick cutover to Docker is feasible or possible? I mean, it, it works if and only if you're in a place where you're already built that way because you designed it that way from day one. One of the most valuable aspects of most technical conferences is the hallway track, but that tends to be a little bit of a misnomer. People see the great talks about Docker, the expressions of success about things that people tried, because no one tends to get up on stage, talk about a time that they tried to deploy a new technology and failed miserably. We want to show our highlight reels, but talking about times that we fail not only tends to uh, not be a very compelling talk, but also tends to upset the PR department at the various companies we work for. Um, you still have problems running Docker. Their API changes with every release, which means your tooling has to as well. And if you want to run, for example, RabbitMQ the way you're supposed to in Docker as a very simple standalone service, you have problems. For example, you have a container, you mount a volume in it, you install RabbitMQ, you start uh, putting things into the queue. Great, it persists to that volume, things are great. You stop the container, you start a new copy of the container mounting the same volume, and your data is gone. Why? Because the host name is intrinsically how RabbitMQ thinks about its own things. Now, you can adjust this so that it winds up uh, capturing that and suddenly it works again, but this is a non-obvious thing, which demonstrates that some of your stateless services aren't nearly as stateless as you think they are. You've got to be able to modify your application heavily to work in a container. I'm not saying that Docker is not the future. I'm not saying that it isn't a technology that we could use in interesting ways to wind up benefiting how we approach the things, but it's, I do think it's important not to get swept up in the hype. You don't need to be an early adopter in most cases, Wait and see. Wait until things stabilize. See if it makes sense before you run this stuff into production and try and run a bank on top of it. So I hope you enjoyed this talk. It was relatively well received at the conference. And if you did enjoy it, again, my uh, username on Twitter is QuinnyPig. Feel free to tweet at me. And my name, of course, is Corey Quinn. If you didn't enjoy this talk, I look like this. I work for SaltStack. My name is Dave Boucher. And this talk was called SaltStack for Intelligent Configuration, Drift, Remediation, and Security. <laughs> Thank yeah. you very much for listening to me. Do we have any questions? Uh, Corey, you're only able to do that because Dave is in Germany right now and he can't catch you. So um, that was slick. Uh, no, thanks, Corey. That was great. Um, we, uh, you know, while you're at it, um, the, you, you were mentioning prior to this this webinar that you will be uh, speaking at a few upcoming uh, conferences as well. Why don't you uh, tell the folks on, on the webinar where where you can be found the the real Corey, not not the uh, the salt stack employee version. Uh, good, good. The real Corey. I'm going to be speaking at a variety of conferences later this year, including uh, Siegel DevOps Days Tel Aviv, DevOps Days Boston, DevOps Days Silicon Valley later this week, uh, PuppetCon, if you're willing to bar us over to that side of the world, uh, and I'll also be at Lisa later this fall. All right. Impressive. Impressive uh, tour you've got there. Uh, <laughs> um, so, you know, I obviously... Great presentation, great content, great insights into uh, you know a topic that that everybody is trying to get their head around, especially uh, folks in uh, 
you know, production operations. Uh, um, so yeah, great content today, and I'm sure you've got more lined up uh, through through the end of the year here. Uh, just as a reminder, if, if anybody on uh, on the the webinar does have questions for Corey, please enter them into the chat function in GoToMeeting. Um, in the meantime, uh, as as we uh, watch for additional questions to come in, um, so this is this week is DockerCon, and uh, um, this you know to be completely honest, it wasn't intentional that we scheduled this webinar this uh, you know on, on this topic of the same week of DockerCon, but. You know, they've made some announcements around, you know, addressing some of the things, uh, some of the uh, concepts that you've uh, brought up in, in your presentation here, Corey. Is it, does, this, does your presentation, your thoughts on the, this topic change at all based on any of, the, uh, any of the announcements you saw come out of DockerCon this week? Absolutely. Uh, there were a couple of points that I want to make. Uh, the first off is that they're making a big plan to orchestration that starts to solve at least a few layers of that Docker cliff, which is great but this was announced yesterday. So it starts to be a situation of let's let things bake a little bit longer before we jump on them in production. Let's see them get a version or two under their belt. Let's let other people figure out what some of those use case models look like. Uh, the second is there's a non-trivial number of people who are going to look at a presentation like this and tell me that I'm way off base, that they've considered this, this, and this, and here's why it doesn't apply to them. And to those people, I say, congratulations, great. If you can look at a presentation like this and already understand where the pitfalls are and already have a plan to mitigate them that makes sense for you, then please, go nuts. I'm, I'm trying to speak to the common case with best practices. I'm not saying that, oh, no one ever on the face of the planet should consider doing this thing. But, I, but the entire reason I built this was to provide a bit of a voice for, shall we say, caution and being technologically conservative in the face of something new and exciting. Again, I feel like I need to make very clear that I am not anti-Docker. I think they're doing something absolutely amazing. They are changing uh, what it, how you write software on a Mac to deploy into a Linux environment. You're changing how people start to think about their applications, and that is no small feat. I am tremendously impressed by what they've achieved. My entire thesis really comes down to just think about it before you bring this awesome shiny toy into production because it will fail in interesting ways and it will wake you up because it's technology. That's what it does. I don't think we have anything that doesn't do that at some point in its life cycle. All right, very good. So another question. Um, so are you or how are you and would you be willing to share uh, some level of detail of how you're using uh, SaltStack and Docker together uh, in your either your current role or uh, in previous uh, lives? Sure. At the moment today, we are not running Docker in production. So we are using it for some development aspects, but one of the things that we are starting to do as we are looking at the idea of migrating legacy containers into a, into a uh, sorry, legacy applications into a containerized world is we're talking to some extent about how do we make those containers, which right now are fairly fat because they have entire uh, operating systems inside of them, how do we make them look like production? So we are using uh, SaltStack in production, and we're using a very mo a slightly modified form of that inside of these uh, containerized world as an experiment. Longer term, probably not going to go that direction for running things productionalized, but it's a good first attempt. We would still use uh, SaltStack, assuming a magic future where everything is all Docker all the time. We would still use SaltStack to wind up configuring various aspects of what we're, uh, of what the hosts themselves look like. We would, for example, I think a lot of the work done with the proxy minion is extremely valuable. You can run a salt minion on the on your infrastructure host itself and have the proxy minion reach out via either the Docker command line or the Docker API, depending upon your level of boldness, and have it alter container behavior based upon uh, what messages it receives, which makes the whole rolling deploy process work uh, a lot smoother as well. But again, these are still early days. We haven't, we're still in a place now where we're playing around in sandboxes, doing things by hand. We aren't looking to productionalize how we're building toys at the moment. When the time comes for us to start switching on Dockerized uh, microservices in production, there's probably going to be a very different answer to that question. The answer right now is we're not sure yet. All right, very good. Well, Corey, this has been uh, entertaining, enlightening, informative, uh, all in one. We appreciate you taking the time uh, to uh, 
re-deliver uh, this, this presentation that uh, you, you shared with us at SaltConf 16 initially. Uh, we, we thank you for the info. Um, and just as a reminder to the attendees of the webinar, we uh, have recorded this and we will provide the recording uh, to you very soon. Uh, thank you, Corey, again, and thank you, everybody, for your interest in, in SaltStack and uh, this, this webinar series, and we will be in touch. Thank you. Bye-bye.